Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Energy News Beat Daily Stand Up. Today is Saturday, the weekly recap. I'll tell you what, I have never been so tired keeping an eye on all the news for you. It is absolutely crazy what's going on around out there. I mean, after our last podcast came out on Thursday, then we've had Ford scraps another SUV, $1.9 billion in EV ambitions. Uh, unbelievable. Then we have even more stories on the Texas grid. We've had another tanker hit in the uh, Red Sea and and uh, the Houthis hit a grease tanker. I'm not sure what's going on, but I'm going to turn this over to the staff and they're going to put together our week's best story. So sit back and get caught up on the whole week. S- subscribe, like, share. And if you're a trader and you're wanting to buy or sell oil and gas assets and or uh, crude or LNG, let me know. Go to energynewsbeat.co forward slash trading desk. And I want to hear from you and we'll put you right in touch with the right folks to get you taken care of on all that. Thanks and have an absolutely wonderful weekend. The new era in nuclear power in the U.S. Michael, this is really kind of ironic when you sit back and look at the U.S. Palisades power plant could become the first power plant to reopen in the U.S. after shutting down, potentially signaling a new era for nuclear power. Finally, we need it. This was shut down. This was shut down 40 years ago in operation in May of 2022, but it was due to cheap, abundant natural gas. <laughs> <laughs> you got to love it. Yeah, I saw this one tweet today. I don't have it up in front of me, but somebody said if we discovered natural gas today it would be hailed as a decarbonizing fuel of the future. So it's kind of unbelievable to see, again, the bait and switch they had. And the nuclear industry has been getting pounded. I love the fact that we're actually thinking about getting this up and running. My only concern is going to be a lot of the ongoing costs associated with it. We know this stuff is getting regulated into obs- obscurity. The real question is, are they? is there enough? Is there enough money to go around? I mean, because the the problem with nuclear right now is it's actually not the lowest kilowatt per hour available because of all the regulations that are put on top of it. So if we're going to turn this nuclear power plant on, but keep all of the owner's regulations, I'm not sure what good that does. Well, half the cost is uh, the original installation. And and so when you sit back and say, hey, I'm going to forget about that, though, do what? We can't forget about that, though. Oh, yeah. But, you know, when you sit back, one 800 megawatt reactor could provide enough power for 800,000 homes or X number data centers. So it is dispatchable on demand flatline power. I mean, you can't you cannot buy flatline power at a what if you're talking AI and you're talking everything else. Just dispatchable power, a stream is what nuclear is. You love it. Yeah, I, I think it'll be very interesting to know how much, you know, I mean, you're talking about $6 billion in funding to get a lot of these old school nuclear power plants up and running. I hope that's enough money because, again, the big problem with all this stuff is well, that let's you've take got a runaway at, costs. Okay, let's take a look at $6 billion if it goes into wind and solar. Six dollars goes into wind and solar, and you may only get fifteen percent of that nameplate that you put out there at any given moment. If you put six billion dollars into nuclear, you get a hundred percent of that nuclear power. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not disagreeing with any of this, and I'd much rather this go to power homes than go to power some rogue data center somewhere. I mean, I think if the trade off is we get a eight hundred thousand homes powered, I'll take that over you know some low cost data center even though we need data centers but yeah Yeah. i do love the fact that a lot of this was you know if there's anything that was good that came out of the inflation reduction act which is just such a hilarious name considering where we're at this is some good stuff let's lebanon faces power blackouts as clashes with israel intensifies michael this is absolutely horrific the whole Middle East is just going bonkers. The Castro Mediterranean country has been suffering from severe power rationing for decades as political bickering stales the overhaul to fail 
to overhaul the entire electrical electricity sector. It's they still use diesel, they still use gasoline. I mean, it it's just fuel in in Lebanon is critical. It's well, we have- I think it's it's critical everywhere. I mean, it's it's right now it's the only fuel that's really working. I mean, you 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 know, there's not much wind and solar going on in Lebanon right now. This article does point out that they're actually in the midst of their worst financial crisis in de- decades right now that's been going on since 2019. Government has defaulted on its international debt and there's not much support going around to support them. So they're okay. they're basically rationing power over them. And you feel sorry for all the people that are, you know, all the citizens right there. Because that's always, as we always point out, that's who takes it in the shorts. Exactly. I, I don't care what country you're from. It's the citizens that we care about. And and let's keep a, a level head on here. Novatech, I, do, you, do you remember four years ago when I was at Intercom and I met one of the head guys at Novatech, he actually came into a New York conference and he was a cool cat. I enjoyed talking to him and it was, it was a lot of fun, but Novatech set dock at second LNG unit at sanctioned Arctic plant. They don't care. They have a third train coming on and this thing is going to be pumping it out. And you take a look, that satellite picture imagery of this thing is it took four months to drag the dock over from where they built it to where they're installing it. And let's see here, how much are they going to be putting in it? It was originally designed to have three production trains with a total capacity of 19.8 million tons a year. That's a lot of LNG, man. Well, I think Russia is realizing that I think they've seen Saudi Arabia and what Saudi Aramco and all of these Middle Eastern national oil companies are doing by locking in long term LNG contracts. It's one of the few ways to make LNG profitable. I mean, you look around, especially in the United States right now, I mean, natural gas is not a profit. It's a byproduct of what you want to get, which is oil. But in terms of what's going to be long term future from power locking in these long-term contracts is critical i think russia they're just giving everybody a middle finger and saying hey we're doing this hey we're doing it we're doing this you know and and i'll tell you we need to get henry winkler on the show the original fonzie to try to teach us how to do a better putin but when we sit back michael and take a look you know putin could care less and he's doing what's right for russia he may be an animal and he may not be a good guy, but he's doing Russia first. Yeah. I mean, you, you can't disagree there. I mean, it, it, it's just like Canada is finally, if they would take care of their LNG and they would export to Asia, the price for Asian LNG is going to double in the next few years. The demand for LNG in Asia and Canada could be a huge supplier there. Well, Canada's moving solely to solar, so they'll they'll, they'll be out of the picture soon. Holy smokes! <laughs> no, they won't because they've got too much oil there. Trust me. It's we we could get into all this. You got anything else? Uh, we're gonna have a great week. Hey, by the way, the Democrats are gearing up for their convention today, so this will be a big big day. Buckle up. Yeah, are you gonna go? Are you are you? You're not flying to Chicago? No man on the street interviews? No, you didn't get the I'm gonna, invite? I'm going to avoid some donkey pox. I do not need to be anywhere near... Oh, monkey pox. Excuse me. Not donkey pox. My apologies. But I just saw two two really funny tweets. They've already got bricks light up for the 100,000 Antifa people they're expecting. It, instead of a gift bag with cookies, they're handing out gift bags with bricks. That's funny. <laughs> U.S. House hearing reveals U.S. could experience 48 wind blade failures per year. This is pretty unbelievable. This all goes back to what happened in the vineyard wind development earlier this year as one of the blades fell off, scattering fiberglass and all this stuff everywhere. You know, basically what happened was people started freaking out. Two U.S. representatives, Representative Jeff Van Drew, a Republican from New Jersey, and Representative Scott Harry, a Republican from Pennsylvania, decided to hold a hearing to develop to, you know, basically determine the impacts of wind on the East Coast. 
And there were some really interesting things that came out. So here's a few quotes I'll read. This is from Representative Van Drew himself. These would be the largest wind turbines in the world. He's speaking of the Atlantic Shores Wind Project, which was approved in July. Basically, there's going to be 195 new wind turbines at 850 feet tall. These are off the coast of New Jersey. Quote, here back to the quote. These would be the largest wind turbines in the world. We will be an experiment for the world right here in your home at the Jersey Shore. Dozens of these turbines will be highly visible and maybe even audible, particularly in Bridgington. This is, you know, we've got uh, Amy DeSiblo. She's a board member for A. A or ACK for Wales, a Nantucket-based environmental group who's opposed to offshore wind development. See, we've got something in common with these environmentalist groups. She testified that in twenty that in twenty fourteen, an offshore wind insurer estimated that out of seven hundred thousand blades operating globally at the time, thirty eight hundred failed each year from a range of causes, including lightning damage, human error, and manufacturing defects. She also estimated that there are three thousand operating off the east coast, or three thousand wind turbines operating off the east coast. So we could see as much as. 48 blade failures every year, like the one we saw in Nantucket. Pretty unbelievable, but this is also interesting. So with an average wind power or an average power of about 10 megawatts per turbine, it's going to take about 3,000 turbines to meet that offshore wind goal is what she said. The difference is what her analysis doesn't take into account is the fact you have three blades per wind turbine. So that number could be as high as 130 if we're actually talking about the, you know, scaling this up, you know, as we know, if this, you know, back what happened in Nantucket, it was pretty unbelievable. You had, you know, foam, fiberglass, epoxy being scattered all over the place. I mean, we also were, were, were talking about, you know, we were also talking again about what happened when it came to the whales. We know, you know, if you're a long time listener to the show, you know, this is the one thing I like about Wind is that it's disintegrating and actually decimating the whale population. Get rid of them. I don't care. Clearly a joke, but let's go with it here, folks. You know, this is also interesting. You know, this DeSiblo, who's ahead of this, this, this whale program, which we don't need, she brought a piece of the blade that actually washed up near her home to the hearing. She testified, and I'm reading now straight from the article, that the event has greatly shifted the public sentiment towards the offshore wind industry on Marsh's Vineyard. She said that community depends on tourism, which debris from the broken glass is impacting. We'll go down and and we got to worry about the whales, I guess, a little bit in 2022. Save the Save Right Whales Coalition, which raises awareness for the impact of offshore wind development on the critically endangered North Atlantic right whale, documented a number of these unfortunate events. Nobody in the you know nobody wants to actually cover these, which I mean, rightfully so. I mean, this is this goes anti environmental. You're just now killing the whales. And again, offshore wind is horrible. I mean, there's very there's little good about offshore wind. It's inefficient. It's an eyesore. It's harmful to the environment. It's the exact opposite of trying to be environmentally friendly. Maybe it's renewable, but it's not really renewable from the standpoint of there's a lot of, you know, discharge capacity. It's only when the wind is blowing. I mean, it, offshore wind, in my opinion, is one of the worst forms of quote unquote renewable energy. You might as well. I'm more, if you had to rank what I think is like the worst renewables, offshore winds at the top. Onshore is pretty, pretty bad. I mean, solar is not as bad as this because at least solar, you can work around all other, you, you know, you can work around stuff. It's unbelievable. It, it's pretty unbelievable. These, you know, one of the quotes is these underwater pal driving hammer blows are compelled to do blasts from 155 milliliter howitzer cannon or cannon in the air. Such noise blasts are far too loud to be permitted anywhere near whale habitats. I mean, it's pretty unbelievable, especially building these things. You know, the Rand Acoustics LLC has produced two studies that find these impacts are in extensive when it comes to just, you know, noise pollution for these. Well, I mean, it's pretty unbelievable. If people, if people are in favor of offshore wind, you know, one, they even haven't done their research. Two, they're just ignorant and don't want to know and don't want to take the time. Three, don't really care. They're just in it for the money. So it's one of those three buckets when you're when you're offshore wind. I'm telling you, it's one of those three buckets. If you're into offshore wind, you fall into. You're ignorant. You just haven't done your research, which, hey, you, you didn't do your research. That's fine. But ignorance, bucket one, that's you refuse to do the research because you don't want to know the answer. Or your bucket number three where you're just, you don't care. You're just in it for the money. You don't like that oil and gas donates to the right side of the aisle. You're on the left side of the aisle. So I'm going to stand up for offshore wind because it's environmentally friendly. 
because I can make money off it. It's the worst kind of diary of a mad natural gas producer man. This one was kind of funny in the without in when you sit back and take Terry Edom is author of a great book. You've got to run out and the his link to his book is in the show notes. He's a good friend. I've had an interview with him many times for, and this is from the BOE report. But I did on X take a look at his title, the first paragraph. With all due respect to Ozzy Osbourne, a guy that lived the rock star life, who drank enough alcohol to float an aircraft carrier, who took enough drugs to stun a small nation, who survived all that, raised a family, survived to 76 and counting, and is worth 200 million. That's not a madman, that's a genius. Well played, sir. So I thought that was pretty funny. I took it one step further. And Terry, I went out to X and went to Groke and I said, create a picture on the floor of an oil derrick working and Ozzy Osbourne is the oil rig hand. And that's not a bad picture. Well done, Elon and Gronk. I, I thought that was a pretty good picture a cover story. But as we dive into this one, you take a look in what industry would you consider producers accelerate production at such a rapid clip? while simultaneously driving prices into the toilet. you That's what's happening with natural gas. Today, it's like $2.10. It's unbelievable. When you take a look at this, um, it is the cheapest form of energy that the U.S. can possibly produce right now with the least amount of impact on the environment. When you take a look at the technologies of fracking improvements over the first wave of growth, but don't completely explain the steepest part. When you take a look over the four year, the U.S. added 27 BCF per day, which is about 1.5 times Canada's entire output while the prices fell from about $3 to $2. That's the sort of annex the guy like Warren Buffett would like. But when we sit back and take a look, whatever, something will come of this out of the blue to send the gas, send the gas market into more spasms in a year. Gas prices will probably be 50 cents or $12 or maybe both in one day. Don't look behind the curtain. We're not well. And I love the way that he's phrasing this discussion is that there are things that are not making sense in our entire energy pricing matrices. I've been talking with folks about why in the world is it that the OPEC and OPEC plus cannot control their pricing models for Brent and taking a look at it. Well, you have 700 ballparkish in the dark fleet that are outside of sanctions. How much of those 700 tankers are running around the world buying and selling oil that is outside of the OPEC and OPEC plus pricing matrices that's normal? Well, LNG, as I've been reporting on this, has stepped up and we now have a dark side of the fleet to LNG tankers. LNG tankers now are going through and... They are outside of sanctions. Russia, Michael and I talked about that on, on Monday's show. Enbridge CEO Ebo says colossal AI power use, US LNG doubling. I thought this was an outstanding article. It was from Bloomberg and it was with an interview. And when we take a look, he came to the Enbridge in the $28 billion takeover of natural gas transporter Spectra Energy Corp in 2017, and he became the CEO last year. Eibel's comments were on a variety of energy topics in an interview at Bloomberg's headquarters in New York on Tuesday. He was asked, how do you see the role for U.S. and global oil markets? The future of oil in North America is through it and out of it. You see that the, that on the export side. Just in the last three or four years, we've gone large into oil exports at Enbridge. We own the largest facility now in Corpus Christi called Ingslide, which is hits record after record every quarter. The Permian continues to pump a lot of oil and associated gas, and that's going abroad. So I'll go with the trend, and I'll say the trend is more oil demand year on year. I like what he's saying. Here's another question from Bloomberg. 
are you anticipating the rise of arti- artificial intelligence will affect natural gas and electricity demand? His answer. We've had electricity demand largely flat for decades here in North America. Our view is that it will add somewhere between a half a percent and 2%, which might not sound like much, but per annum through 2030, that's a colossal move. Ibel said 45% of all natural gas fired generation in North America is within 50 miles of its pipelines. That is a huge note for investors and EMP operators when you're sitting there taking a look. How's your offtake when you're when you're drilling a well? And then you have Enbridge with the pipelines and the power plants being built near their pipelines. So if you want low cost power, here's here's an antidote. If you want low cost power, live near a Enbridge pipeline. Not a bad idea. 